start module one by explaining what the global urbanization and environmental challenges are. But before going and explaining all of these challenges, let us start with some good news. Over the last two centuries, global population went from 1 billion to over 7 billion. What's interesting to see is that this increase of population really kicked off after the 50s. Another fact that's interesting to see here is if you look at the red part of the graph, which indicates the number of people living in extreme poverty, it went up a bit until the 70s and then sharply decreased after that. What's also interesting to see is that the share of people living in extreme poverty was almost 90 to 95 percent two centuries ago. Today this share has dropped to only 11 percent. Couple this with the fact that life expectancy has increased both globally and by world region over the last two centuries. Two centuries ago we used to live somewhere between 25 and 35 years. Today, even in Africa, we live more than 60 years, and in the world, the average life expectancy is around 70 years old. Not only we're living uh, longer, child mortality is also decreasing. From the 50s to today, you can see that child mortality in Africa went from 35 to somewhere less than 10%. In the world, this figure went from 22 to less than 5%. So we're living more, we're living better, and uh, our ch uh, children have a better chance to survive. All of this is coupled with the fact that GDP per capita, so the purchasing power per person in all parts of the world, has also increased over the years. Now, from the 50s to today, some countries like the United States have seen their GDP increase almost three times. Uh, in, peop uh, in countries like Botswana, the GDP per capita has increased more than 10 to 15 times in only 50 years. Yet all of the above mentioned uh, economic development and um, increase of human well-being was only possible through a global material extraction. As you can see here in this graph, global material extraction increased from seven gigatons per year, so 7 billion tons per year, to 70 gigatons per year. That's an increase of 10 times in over one century. What I'd like to point out here is that the um, global material extraction really picked up after the 50s, like the previous graphs. What is also important to have a look here is that not all material types increased in the same way. For instance, biomass, here in orange, increased by a factor of 4, whereas construction materials, in blue, increased by a factor of 42. Now, this graph is the same as the, the one in left, but is expressed in per capita terms. So now we're talking about the global material extraction per capita. At the beginning of the 20th century, per capita extraction was... Uh, at 4.5 tons per capita and at the end of the century it was something around 10 tons per capita. This is an increase of uh, a factor of two almost. It means that today we're increasing two times more per person for every person around the planet than we did at the beginning of the century. What's also interesting to see here is that this increase really stepped up after the 50s once again. Uh, in contrast with the, uh, with the graph on the left, you can see that biomass consumption also remained stable or decreased a bit uh, over the last century, whereas construction materials still increased very much. What we can say here with this graph is that uh, per person we consume more to build cities and infrastructure than to feed ourselves. Yet extraction, uh, extracting materials and material consumption is not without environmental consequences. They can alter ecosystems, they can damage biodiversity, but they can also generate different types of pollution, ranging from solid waste to air pollution. Not surprisingly, CO2 emissions have also increased during the last two centuries, 
Once again, you can see the steep increase after the 50s. This increase is mainly due to consumption of fossil fuels in different forms. For instance, coal from the beginning of the 19th century, oil from the beginning of the 20th century, and natural gas from mid 20th century. The increasing amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has also resulted to what is called greenhouse gas effect. Greenhouse gas effect has increased, uh, has led to the increase of global average temperature. This graph shows that average temperature has been increasing since the 50s uh, at almost one degree over the last 60 years. Now, this increase of temperature is melting ice from both poles and contributes to sea level rising and could affect a great amount of global population and damage uh, a great amount of urban uh, areas. It can also lead to what uh, is called climate change. Um, now, one concept that summarizes all of the above challenges is ecological footprint. Ecological footprint measures how much biologically productive area is used by humans to fulfill their needs. This red line shows the evolution of the ecological footprint from the 60s to today. The graph shows that ecological footprint went from 0.7 to almost 1.6 or 1.7 um, today. Now, this is measured in number of Earths. This means that um, today we are consuming 1.5 or uh, sorry, 1.6 um, Earths in order to uh, satisfy our needs. But what, how, how can we really uh, need 1.7 Earths when we only have one? It means that the biosphere produces or the biosphere needs 1.6 years to regenerate all the natural resources that are consumed by humans in only one year. So it means that we have an ecological deficit. The planet uh, provides a biocapacity that you can here, see here in the graph in green, a certain amount of um, ecological services, but we consume more than what the Earth can regenerate at the same amount of time. Another concept that helps us understand our environmental challenges is planetary boundaries. This concept subdivides our effect on the environment in nine different boundaries. It was developed to estimate the safe operating space where human can operate without harming the planet and therefore ourselves. This figure shows that we already have crossed three planetary boundaries by 2009 and we could cross some more very rapidly. Again, by this type of um, concepts, we show that the effect that human uh, anthropogenic activities have on the planet are way beyond the ones that, can, that Earth can sustain. At the moment, we have just exposed some of the major environmental challenges we are facing. If you remember well, a great share of material extraction um, and their associated effects is going to uh, building and running cities. If you remember, we used more materials to uh, build cities and to fuel cities than to actually feed humans. To put this into perspective, at this stage, uh, cities occupy 2% of land, uh, of global land area. They host more than 50% of global population, but they're responsible for three quarters of global energy use and pollution emissions um, at the same time. This means that cities are not only the main responsible actors for our environmental impact, but they're the key actors to uh, to combat climate change. This is exactly why this course focuses on how we can reduce urban resource use and pollution emissions. The different uh, parts um, will explain what type of tools we can use in order to conceptualize uh, urban resource use and pollution emissions, account them, 
but also propose different policies to mitigate them.